It is two o'clock. It is Thursday. It is VFI Educates episode 194 on June 22nd. We have a number of announcements today. Uh, the first one is uh, we experienced a number of things over the past seven days. Uh, one of them or two of them have not been acknowledged. The first one is Father's Day. Everybody who's a father, raise your right hand and swear after me. I did it. Okay. Congratulations. The second is we did suffer through something called uh, the summer solstice, which is congratulations, the beginning of our summer. We made it to another summer. Uh, the third is a new hurricane named Brett that started the Caribbean. I expect to see Brett hanging around by the next time we get together. Um, in Israel, there's been a number of security issues, a number of judicial issues. The, the Druze got out of hand, Netanyahu was in trouble. Holy moly, things are really active, and I think we're going to hear a lot more about that uh, because we're delighted to have David Pomerantz with us today as our speaker. And uh, Daniel. Lastly, Daniel. Uh, Daniel, sorry, thank you. Pamela, previously from Chicago in another century, but Pamela- in another what? Century? Another mm -hmm. century, right. <laughs> Pamela mm -hmm. will introduce our guest lecturer speaker today. Thank you. Okay, so our guest speaker is Daniel Pomerantz. Where did, oh, there you are, okay. Um, Daniel, I got to know Daniel when he made Aliyah in 2001. And for those of you who don't know me, I used to be in charge of Sarel. Um, so when Daniel first made Aliyah, he being a new immigrant, a new Ole, he didn't know what to do. So you know, what do people do when they don't know what to do? They join Sarel. So he wound up doing Sarel many, many times. And we got to be good friends through the years. Dan is from Chicago. He practiced law in Chicago and in New York. When he was here in Israel and after he got through with his various Sarel stints, he started Playboy Israel. And uh, that was very popular for a couple of years. And then he started working at the organization called Honest Reporting, which many of you might know about. Uh, he was eventually promoted there to the CE to CEO position. And during his three-year tenure as CEO, he actually increased Honest Reporting's impact and effective, effectiveness for Israel as well as the financial stability to its higher to its highest point in uh, in the 22 years, year history of honest reporting. Dan is also a lecturer at Reichman University, which is, was formerly called the IDC, and also a lecturer at Bar Ilan University. He's also a frequent guest, um, a guest speaker on I24 News, if some of you watch that as well as other international media outlets. And now, just a short while ago, um, Dan founded a new nonprofit organization called Reality Check. And this is what he's going to be talking about today, introducing you to Reality Check, telling you the purpose of it. Um, and he'll also be talking about other issues in Israel these days. Um, I'll put the website, on the chat periodically so you all can see the website of honest reality of uh, sorry of reality check um and it would be it's good to sign up to their email list because they send out periodic uh periodic uh newsletters and nice to see what they are doing and what they talk about and uh so I'll do that and then afterwards, after the after he speaks, uh, we'll put questions. You can put questions in the chat as we go along, and Dan will answer the questions afterwards. And we see that um, Arlene is there with Steve. Very nice. Oh, Great. see where Arlene was. Hi, Arlene. Okay. Surprise. All right. So I introduce you all to Daniel Pomerantz. And you can uh, highlight him, Alana. Okay, there we go. Well, thank you, Pamela, and and hello, everybody. And it's thank you so much for inviting me to be here. It's it's really a pleasure, and it's such a wonderful group. Uh, I was, uh, you know, when I talk about what reality check is and what it really means, the story that comes to mind is um, one day uh, in my previous job, 
I departed a little bit from the organization's mission, uh, which was media bias, and put together a, uh, a, a research study. And the research study showed uh, something about media coverage and showed that it was uh, the media wasn't covering anti-Semitism as much as it should. But along the way, we also discovered that it wasn't uh, covering some other things as much either as it should, including um, hate crimes against uh, against Asian Americans, against LGBTQ, against other groups. And I got invited to speak about it on CBS News uh, in New York on their national broadcast. And so I was very excited to go do that. But then I got uh, I got the the notice that because uh, it was the tail end of COVID restrictions, they weren't going to be doing makeup for um, for guests. So you know what do I know about makeup, right? But I, I what I know about makeup is that when you're on television, you have to wear it. <laughs> so this is what I'm left with. So I start calling uh, everyone uh, I can think of who might be helpful, mostly the various women in my life and. Uh, one of them tells me you have to go to Sephora. Does everyone here know what, what Sephora is? I say all, all the women are nodding their heads. So for the men out there, Sephora is a makeup store, but it's like it's like the equivalent of I don't know Disney World for makeup. It's it's this enormous store. It's got everything. At least the one I was in it was in the Times Square branch, which has multiple floors and it has more different products than I thought existed. And, and a fancy lighting everywhere. And so I walked in and asked uh, for help. And I, and, and the very nice sales girl comes over and says, uh, you know, what do you need to do? And I explained, I'm going to be on television. So I need uh, makeup that's appropriate for that. And then uh, she starts asking, you know, she's doing the thing where she like takes the samples and she puts them on my face. And then I look in the mirror and I see which one is the right color, you know, all that stuff. And meanwhile, she says, what uh, are you on television for? And I explained to her about what we're doing and how the study shows, you know, Jews, but LGBTQ and, and Asians and, and, uh, and all the different groups that are impacted. And she says, oh, my God, that's so meaningful. It's so important. She says, I'm trans. And I had no idea because she looked very feminine to me. And uh, she said, you know, people don't know and they this and that and what we go through and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, you could have a whole discussion about whether uh, trans people face a lot of discrimination or not. The truth is, I really don't know. It's not something that affects my life closely, and it's not something that my work is focused on. But what I did realize was that for the first time, literally in my life, I'm talking to a person who is very woke, trans, very left, and yet she's she he is getting excited, really excited about my work for Israel and for Jewish communities. And I had never seen anything like that before. And, you know, we sort of walk around the world with this feeling of, okay, well, you know, kind of uh, we're getting more support on the right, maybe a little left on less on the left, even though most Jews in America still vote Democrat, there's there's this whole extreme wing of the Democratic Party that we're losing, and and we we wonder what can we do. And then our kids on campus uh, are we're, we're, first of all they are having a difficult experience, and we're also losing some of them as well because because they're not sticking with us. And what can we possibly do? And sort of the old school approach that sort of worked since we had the little blue and white pushkis with the coins in the 1950s was you just talk about how Israel's so great and we're so wonderful and we're facing terrorism and everyone else is so terrible. And look, it's true, but it doesn't resonate with young people. It doesn't work. And I had found something that did. And I knew at that moment that I was going to have to dedicate my, if I was gonna stay in this field of advocacy for Israel and Jewish communities, I was going to have to dedicate myself to doing it in this way. And so not long after I started Reality Check, which is entirely dedicated to putting together credible research studies that really resonate with people. Now, you guys all know Amnesty International and uh, Human Rights Watch, these organizations that proved, proved that Israel is an apartheid state, right? They proved it by doing research studies. They get even you can you can badmouth them all they want, but they get tremendous credibility and tremendous visibility in the world. And a lot of the reason is because they do research studies. And so it occurred to me, well, if they can do it, you know, we can do it and we should do it. And as we started putting together our first study, we got the uh, attention of the United Nations and we're now working together with UNESCO to put together this study, which is just 
um, which is it, it's just really exciting because you know the United Nations has what's called the halo effect. It has credibility. If the UN said something, it must be true. And now I don't think that, and probably you don't think that, but there are a lot of other people who are outside the choir, so to speak, who do think that. And I thought, well, heck, if we can get the UN's credibility on our side, we already have truth on our side. If we can get the UN's credibility on our side, we certainly deserve it. We can start making a real impact and changing the minds of the people that we need to reach, people on the left, people who are young, people who uh, are on campus where it's very difficult, and also people who are on the right who just have a need to communicate with people on the left or people in their communities. So I'll start by telling you a little bit about what our first research project is, and then I'll tell you a little bit about some of the things that we're doing with that research. And then if you're all interested, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, what's going on in Israeli politics today and how we communicate about that. And uh, and then finally, we'll open it up to Q&A. So let's see if I can do the sharing correctly. I've got a new computer and the sharing doesn't work perfectly, but let's see if I can get it to work right. OK, so we got this. Did I get this right? And uh, now if I pull this up, you can see this is our website. And uh, so it'll the, the link will be in the uh, chat and you can go take a look at it and you can see what we do. And our partners got a nice quote there by Richie Torres and some of the different work we're doing and the articles we've published. Um, so that's our website. But let me tell you a little bit about our first research report, which is right here. Our first research report, we started off with what's called a desk study, which means we took publicly available data. We went to the FBI hate crimes database uh, and also to the various uh, state laws and put together an analysis. And the analysis was, does Holocaust education work and what impact does it have? And then what we found, we compared, you know, in America, there's 50 states. That was not part of our study. We already knew that before. But there are 50 states in America. And of those, 20 have mandatory Holocaust education laws. Three have recommendations. And we started examining the impact that Holocaust education has on hate crimes. If you compare the states that have mandatory Holocaust education to the states that don't, what result do you get? And what we discovered is on this page here that if you have Holocaust education, if you compare the states, it reduces hate crimes against Black communities by over 55%, which is even more than the reduction against Jewish communities. That's only 54.81%, but that's still a lot. LGBTQ is 43%, Native Americans 39%. Hispanic 34, Muslim 24%, and, uh, and Asian, and so the list goes on. And we have a couple other charts here that show, uh, show how all of these things break down. You can see that states without these hate crime laws versus states with hate crime laws. The thing about Jews is, first of all, we are the most targeted group for hate crimes per capita out of any other bar none. The other thing about Jews is that not that many people really care about us that much. It might not feel like it to us <laughs> because we live in our world, but uh, but we're, you know, a tiny percent of the U.S. population and most Americans don't care that much. But if you can go to somebody and say, look, if your issue is Black Lives Matter, guess what? Holocaust education. If your issue is Islamophobia, guess what? Holocaust education. If your issue is LGBTQ and trans issues and gay pride. Guess what? Holocaust education. And if you can meet people where they are on the issues that are important to them and show them that what's important to us is also important to them, you start getting support in ways that you never got it before. We, uh, you know, we, we know this is true already because when we talk about, you know, there's that old poem, um, when uh, they what, first they came for the communists and I didn't speak out because I wasn't a communist and then they came for the Jews and I didn't speak out because I wasn't a Jew, et cetera, et cetera. And the last line in the poem is and then then by the time they came for me, there was no one left to speak up. That is a fundamental truth in the world. We know it's true. It's just that now for the first time we actually have data and that's really exciting. So the, the idea is that once you start talking about this, though, this gives us the ability to talk about all kinds of different issues because it gives us credibility. The next time Whoopi Goldberg or Kanye West speaks up and says something hateful, I want to be the person that the press and that the communities turn to to step up and speak about it. And the way you get that credibility 
is through doing this kind of work, is through having credible research studies. Why would someone ask a representative of Amnesty International to speak about some issue precisely because of, of these reasons? Now, uh, we've only existed for just a little over three months, so we're uh, a very, very new organization. We've done a ton in an incredibly short amount of time, uh, but we have a lot more to do. So you might hear me sometimes speaking in aspirational terms, like this is what we plan to do or are working toward doing. And the reason I speak that way is just because we've been at this a short time, although I personally have been uh, doing this sort of work for the past uh, seven, almost eight years. Hard, hard, hard to believe that it's been that long. So uh, one of the one of the things we did is I'll just show you. Here's an example. I24 News asked me to, to come on their show. And uh, and I was speaking about an issue that was not directly related to Holocaust education in America, but there's enough of a connection that it caused me to be the right person to speak on this issue. So let's see if I can pull this up here. Um, For more on this, we are joined by Daniel Pomerantz in our studio as the CEO of Reality. Is the, everyone can hear the sound, right? Okay. We check in. A legal and political analyst. Thank you very much, Daniel, for joining us. Well, that's the big question. Is this isolated? Is this a larger trend? What's going on in Europe right now? In uh, Austria, just this year, there were 719 anti-Semitic attacks. 14 of them were violent assaults and, and the others of various types, such as this train incident. Now, that may not sound like a lot, but the Jewish community of Austria is only 10,000 people, which means as a per capita number, that's seven, a 7,000 per capita number. And just to give a sense of perspective, in America, Jews are the most highly targeted groups with 10 hate crimes per capita capita, black communities are at seven, Muslim communities are at four. In Austria, that number, if you did the same math, would be at 7,000. So this is a, a serious problem and a growing trend. So the big question is, and we've just been discussing during the break, how do you combat this rising trend if it's so disturbing? And it certainly seems to be. Well, in, at Reality Check, what we found is the answer to a great extent is education. Our study that we're working on has uh, shown that states in America that have Holocaust education have vastly lower hate crimes per capita, not just against Jews, but against all groups, blacks, Muslims, LGBTQ, everything. Now, in Austria, there is Holocaust education in the schools, but it's unclear how high the quality is. We found that uh, according to, to statistics released by the uh, Claims Commission and by the uh, Austrian Parliament, the uh, the hate crimes, uh, the, excuse me, the 56% um, of Austrian people don't know that six million Jews died in the Holocaust. That number goes up to 58% among millennials and, and Gen Z. The, uh, the, the something like 30% of Austrians believe that Jews take advantage of the Holocaust, 20% believe that Jews are partly responsible for causing the Holocaust. And the biggest belief in Austria, and this is part of the whole Austrian national identity, is that they were the first victims of Hitler and the Nazis. But of course, a study of the Holocaust shows that they actually welcomed Hitler, not just welcomed him, but welcomed him back as he wasn't originally a Nazi, and uh, excuse me, was originally uh, Austrian, and uh, and in fact, uh, were, were significantly enthusiastic collaborators in, in the work of the Nazis. So there's a, while there's Holocaust education in Austria, there's a great deal of lack of proper knowledge. And we see that playing out in the hate crime statistics. All right, so I can give you some idea of how we're able to talk about these issues. And we do it with a high degree of credibility because we have this knowledge and because we can reach across. And we uh, put uh, this, uh, some of this clip up on our Instagram account and we ended up getting so much argument, Austrians were weighing in, Germans were weighing in, and uh, there was a lot of argument and debate and the clip went viral uh, because I had really touched on the Austrian national identity, which is we were victims. And of course, that's historically untrue. And when you call people out on that, they tend tends to get a lot of uh, excitement and debate going on. But certainly because Austria and a number of countries in Europe aren't dealing with this appropriately, the uh, amount of anti-Semitism is vastly increasing. Now, the, because we speak in this way, it also gives us the ability to talk about other issues. Now, recently, we were invited to speak at, at Harvard, and on campus, wow, you know, the students, they're wonderful students, but they are really, um, they're, they're really under a lot of pressure. They're, it's, it's very intimidating for them. It's scary. The Israeli students uh, won't admit that they're Israeli, which is unusual for me because I'm used to Israelis uh, just not caring what anybody thinks or says. The uh, non-Israeli students are, are very cautious about what they say. 
Uh, I was at the Hillel building there the day after Yom Ha'atzma'ut. They had hung a flag off the balcony for Yom Ha'atzma'ut. And when the Hillel employee noticed the flag, she she got suddenly all, all anxious. Oh, my God, I forgot to take it down. And she ran and pulled that Israeli flag and took it down because, you know, it's something that could be uh, offensive and cause somebody a feeling of microaggression or whatever we call these things these days. So this is um, this is the environment that these students are in. And one of the things that is just taken that is clearly established that it's not even an argument anymore is that Israel is an apartheid state, like period. So this was an area that I was able to speak to the students about and provide them with some tools that they didn't know and do it from a place of credibility and try to really do it in a way that actually works for them so that they can actually share it on campus. Now, if you if you come in there like an Israeli diplomat. Uh, and you say, uh, no, no, listen, they are the terror. That is why we are fightful, but they, we defend uh, from the terror. That is a, this, you know, that doesn't do anyone any good. And if you go out there and say, well, look, I mean, Israel invented cherry tomatoes and has a great high tech sector and uh, beautiful beaches. I mean, that's a great question if somebody asks you, you know, what's Israel all about? But when someone asks you, is Israel an apartheid state? And your answer is, uh, cherry tomatoes, uh, high tech beaches. It's, uh, you know, it sounds like you're trying to uh, hide the elephant in the room. You have to sometimes address these topics head on. But how do you do it in a way that works, especially against people who are being very um, uh, adversarial? So I'll give you just a little example. This is just one of the topics that we talked about uh, at Harvard, but let me show and share this with you. Uh, let's see if I get this right again. Um, here we are. Okay. Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch published studies where they claim to prove that Israel is an apartheid state. What didn't make much uh, get much attention was that the way they proved it was they changed the definition of apartheid on page 37 of, of Amnesty's report. Now, obviously, I could prove that on pineapple if I changed the definition of pineapple, right? Because so many of people on the other side like to point at organizations like HRW and Amnesty International to say Israel's actually apartheid, it's useful to kind of have something on the other side to say, no, this is what's wrong with that. I've had people who, uh, when I you know, start talking about Israel with them, just generally, like, do you want to go to Israel and visit Israel? Something as simple as that, they'll say, I don't want to travel to uh, an apartheid state. Daniel's approach of research, both looking at quantitative and qualitative sources, um, and really emphasizing the importance of taking on these issues through an academic lens and, or an academic style lens, um, is personally what I'm a fan of, personally what I value a lot. I don't care where it was published, I care what it says. And this is published, but it has it's a conjecture, it has no data, so I take it for what it's worth. I accept that that's this person's opinion based on zero research. And you can bring those same tools to everything you hear from every place you hear it. The, the clear tools that he gives on how to converse about Israel and how to deal with anti-Semitism uh, are, are beneficial for Jews and non-Jews alike and would make our world a better place. It could absolutely be helpful to bring to other college campuses to both learn about his perspective and also allow students to strengthen their own because he's so knowledgeable. Getting Daniel onto as many campuses as we can get him onto would be a great idea. But if my mission is to make a difference for students on campus, what do those students really need? And that's what we need to be focusing on. As you can see, it, was, it really meant a lot to those students. And something that they told us uh, they didn't say it in the interviews, and they were they're very cautious. This generation is very worried about causing any offense, and so they're not very good at speaking up. Um, and one of the things I tried to show them through my actions was that, you know, you can disagree. You can even disagree with me. And uh, if I think you're wrong, I'll prove you wrong, but I'll do it in a way that doesn't necessarily cause you harm. And so we can have this conversation. Uh, but one of the things that they said was they found that that a lot of the organizations out there and they mentioned them by name and i'm not going to mention the names because i don't want to say anything negative about any specific organization but they are the organizations the names that you know the biggest names out there these students were specifically saying they are not helpful to us 
We, we see them as being biased and having an agenda. It's a pro-Israel agenda, but that doesn't get us where we need to be. We need something that is not biased, or at least sounds not biased, something that we can share, something that we can work with. And not all the students, by the way, were entirely pro-Israel, which is another important thing that you have to be able to come in there and speak to them in a way that brings them on board with you. You can't just assume that they're gonna support you unconditionally. So what we really are able to do here is, you know, when you go out in your communities, you, you, you want to know what, what you can, what's going on in Israel and how you can speak about it. And a lot of times it might be uncomfortable. Our job, as I see it, is to give you, not just students, but to give you, to give everyone the tools that you need to not just understand what's happening in Israel, but to speak about it in a way that works in your communities when you're not just preaching to the choir, when you're speaking to the people where it might be an uncomfortable conversation, but also a meaningful conversation. And uh, the um, so the next step in our research study, I, I told you we did the desk research where we analyzed the uh, FBI hate crimes database. The next step is what's called the field research. We've just completed uh, a survey of 1500 uh, Americans yeah. ages 18 to 40 across the country. And based on that data, we are now doing the analysis and within about another month we will be publishing the findings of that that gets into if anybody here is a, a statistics geek you may have uh, listened to what I was saying and say hey what about the problem of correlation versus causation this field study gets into that and examines the the deeper causes behind the correlations that we're seeing so we're, we actually do address that and uh, and also examines the variations in quality of holocaust educations across states and whether that makes a difference the next step is for us to put together a co-authorship with UNESCO and Bezrat uh, Hashem, as they say uh, in America, if all goes well, we'll be expanding the study out to Europe and the UK and other places as well, which UNESCO is real enthusiastic about because they sit in Paris and they have a, a lot of focus on, on Europe. So this is, this is the way that we get from issues to data to knowledge that you can actually use. This idea of, you know, Amnesty International proved Israel's an apartheid state. The typical answer is, but Israel's a place where Arabs are members of Knesset and Supreme Court justices and lawyers and doctors and all these things. And it just doesn't kind of resonate with people. They go, like, but Amnesty said that you're also stealing their homes and stealing their land and doing this and doing that. But when you come in, you say, well, you know, Amnesty, they were so desperate to make this apply to Israel that they changed the definition of apartheid and they did it on page 37 of their report that makes a big difference because young people this these days are so sensitive to being misled and if you can show them just a little chink in the armor just the sh just show them a little bit that the person you're relying on has misled you in a specific way i'm not getting angry i'm not saying they're a bunch of liars i'm just showing you this specific example that makes you go oh my gosh and that really hits young people really hard because they're sensitive to that and then that opens you up to be able to have those deeper conversations. I'll show another example of uh, where we used uh, some of our evidence recently. I have a, a, a J Post article here uh, that you can uh, also look up. We'll share all these links with you. Uh, but um, let's see if I can find it. Did I do this right? Um, if, uh, if I did this right. Um, here we go. Yeah, so here's a, a website with uh, of, on the Jerusalem Post. Uh, did Israel commit war crimes in Gaza? You remember we had a, an operation just recently. And so what I did is I examined what the combatant to uh, to uh, civilian casualty ratios were, because that there's always some civilians will will get killed. But the question is, and and the only way to prevent that is to not fight a war at all. But sometimes you have to because there's maybe needs of self defense or present preventing genocide or, or whatever it is. So if you're going to go out there and fight a war, a war should be fought against the fighting forces. And if most of your casualties are civilians, you're probably doing something wrong. And so I went through this whole analysis. You can read it in the J Post article. But the bottom line is that uh, the UN figures say that on average, the uh, the casualty, the civilian to combatant ratio tends to be nine to one around the world. That's an average nine civilians die for every one combatant, which when you think about it is a pretty horrific statistic. Uh, we, I looked at statistics from Afghanistan and Iraq, where numbers were in the neighborhood of uh, three, four, five to one. And in this uh, latest uh, conflict in Israel, the ratio was 0 0.6 to one. So Israel got that ratio down way below what most people in the world ever have. And that that number right there 
gives you a sense that Israel was making a tremendous effort to try and prevent civilian casualties. Incidentally, I also analyzed the casualties that Palestinian Islamic Jihad produced in that conflict, and uh, they managed to kill uh, six civilians, one Israeli, one uh, uh, Gaza resident who was working in Israel at the time, and four residents of Gaza who were killed by their own misfired rockets. So their ratio was six to zero. And the only way to get a ratio like that is if you're not even trying to fight a war, you're actually just trying to harm civilians. So that gives us an ability to talk about these topics in a way that just makes it a, a little bit easier to reach people where they are. One of the next uh, concepts that we're going to be coming up with uh, later down the road uh, in coming years is a, a DEI study, diversity, equity, inclusion, but instead of doing it for individuals or corporations, we're doing it for, um, we're going to be doing it for uh, uh, countries. And when you do that, what you're going to see is Israel may or may not be the absolute best in the world, but it will be up there with the United States, Canada, the European Union, the UK. And uh, then at the other extreme end of the spectrum, you're going to have countries like Iran, where the, the women are protesting the burqa and going to, to jail by the tens of thousands and being executed. You're going to have places like Afghanistan, where women and girls are in just a horrible plight right now. And so by putting this on a scale, you can put Israel into its proper place in the world and use do it using the framing and vocabulary that a lot of people uh, on the liberal progressive left uh, use. And that's what we call reaching people where they are. The way I say it is... Um, you know, my, my friend uh, tried to get me to go swimming the other day. He's a, an open water swimmer, and, uh, and the water was really cold. And so I, 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 just, I didn't want to go in. He said, he said to me, oh, this isn't cold. What are you talking about? This isn't cold. But you know, this guy stuff, like, ah, I'm tougher than you. But of course, that wasn't getting me in because it was cold. But then he changed his tactic. He said, you know, I realized that for you, it's cold because you're a wimp. But OK, that's how guys talk. Right. He said, but here's what I do when actually I feel that it's cold. Here are the tricks that I use to help get myself into the water. So he reached me where I was. He said, all right, you believe it's cold. Fine. Here's what you do when the water is cold. And it worked. And we ended up having a very nice swim. What's the point? The point is reaching people where they are means you don't try to change somebody's underlying beliefs you sh and their values. What you do is you show them that what I want to accomplish actually fits in to your value and belief system. I'm not saying don't be a Democrat. I'm saying if you are a Democrat, you should support Israel because Israel fits the values of the Democratic Party. I'm not saying don't be a liberal progressive. I'm not even saying don't be woke. What I'm saying is if you are woke, you should, you should support Israel because it fits woke values. And, uh, and of course, if you're talking to someone on the right, you can show how it fits values on the right. I really honestly believe that Israel, for all of its problems, and believe me, I've been living here 11 years, Israel has a lot of problems, but uh, Israel is sort of like that family member who drives you absolutely nuts, but they're family, so you keep them around anyway. So Israel does have a lot of problems, but for, for all of those problems, I do believe that on most issues, Israel really does come out ahead. It stands on the right side of history, regardless of whether you're right or left or whatever it is that is, is of value to you, you can find a way to show how Israel fits that. And, uh, and, and because of that fundamental truth, the rest is just finding a way to communicate that underlying truth. Uh, so with that, I, I thought I'd address one more question because I think it's on everybody's mind, which is judicial reform. Is that something people are still thinking about and talking about? Is it really on people's minds? Yeah, I'm seeing some heads nod. Uh, you know that I'm a, a recovering lawyer. The uh, I, that means I used to be a lawyer, but I I've, I've, haven't practiced law in in uh, ten years. So uh, that's that's you know a, an anniversary of sorts. I uh, the first step is admitting that you are a lawyer, and I uh, but because no I, I joke I haven't practiced law as a practicing lawyer, but I do use my legal knowledge uh, almost every day in what I do, and uh, certainly when it comes to to judicial reform, it's been very helpful. One of the things I do that most people don't is I, I, I really delve into the details and read the documents and figure out what's really going on and then begin drawing conclusions. So let me just ask you this, and maybe you know you can give me a, a, a little show of hands. I, Zoom usually has a thing where you can do a little poll. I don't see that here, but let's just do it by, uh, you know, kind of give me a, a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Um, how many people here uh, are paying attention to this topic and 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 following it? 
Okay, so most people are. And how many people feel that uh, to, to you that the topic is um, is is pretty important? Okay, and and how many people here have an opinion on the topic, whether there we should go ahead with this judicial reform or whether we shouldn't? Now, I don't say what your opinion is because I'm not trying to start a, an argument here, um, but just say to yourself, truly, honestly, in your own mind, do you have an opinion? Yeah, so it looks like a lot of people are saying yes. Now, your opinion, is it a strong opinion or is it kind of, eh, I could take it or leave it? Is it a strong opinion? Yes or no? Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of yes. Okay, so now here's this last question and don't answer out loud, but just think about it in your mind and answer honestly to yourself. This topic, which you follow, which you consider uh, important, and this bill that you that you have a strong opinion on, have you read the bill? I'm guessing the answer is mostly no, because among most people, the answer is no. And I'll, I'll admit that actually I had an opinion before I read the bill, and suddenly one day it occurred to me, I haven't even read this thing. So I probably better do that, especially since I'm a lawyer. It's embarrassing that I haven't. So I found the bill, which wasn't easy to do, by the way, because it's not in most of the news, you know, and uh, and then I read it. And having read it, the interesting thing that happened is it didn't change my opinion that I held before but it deepened my opinion i understood more clearly why i believe what i believe and the result was that now when i talk about this with people instead of having arguments i have actual conversations because i have that little bit of depth there this happened by the way back when israel passed the nation state law i mean the thing is like one page long it's translated into english and nobody i have a friend who was a journalist for cnn never read the thing I, how could you not read it it's part of your job and uh and when you read it you find that whatever your opinion is you're able to talk about it with a little more nuance and depth um so i'll be taking questions in just a few minutes so have them prepared or put them up in the chat but i'll tell you what i learned from following this and and reading this israel as you know or as you may know does not have a constitution how do you have a democracy without a constitution? Well, Israeli styles, everything's just, you know, chaos. But one of the things that, that we have in Israel is called basic laws, which are kind of the equivalent of a constitutional law. And they address things like the structure of the government and the various different powers that the different branches of government have, and uh, the, the most fundamental individual rights that you shouldn't be able to change. And so in that sense, it's kind of six to one, half a dozen to the other. America has a constitution, Israel has basic laws, there's still branches of government, there's checks and balances, there's individual rights. So it shouldn't be a problem, right? Except for one thing. Because we don't have a constitution, the only way you can pass any law is by getting a majority vote in the Knesset. As you probably know, the Knesset has 120 people, 120 members of Knesset, which means to get a law passed, you need a majority, which is 61. And that includes passing basic laws. Just to put this in perspective, in America, the Supreme Court has a lot of power, but one thing the Supreme Court cannot do is override the Constitution. So, for example, if you make a constitutional amendment saying uh, we have prohibition and alcohol is illegal, the Supreme Court cannot override that. It's in the Constitution. The only way to change it is to change the Constitution. How do you change the Constitution? You have to get a two thirds vote, not just of Congress, but of two thirds of the state legislatures, which is an almost impossible task. That's what we call in law a supermajority vote. And that's by design, because if you could change the Constitution just with a simple majority vote, which means 51%, you could, for example, if, um, if you got a majority of Democrats in Congress, they could pass a law with just 51% saying for now on Republicans aren't allowed to vote. Or if Republicans got a majority, they could pass a law saying for now on the Democratic Party is disbanded and all Democrats have to go to jail. Like you could pass those laws. The only reason you can't, you don't see those laws being passed is because to do something like that would require a super majority and no party in America ever has quite enough to accomplish that. And that's important because on the one hand, your country should be responsive to the will of the people. If the voters vote for Democrats or for Republicans, then yeah, the country for the next few years is gonna go in that direction because that's what the voters asked for. But if the party in power has the ability to 
eliminate other parties or eliminate individual rights, well, the result is that it ends the democratic system. So we want to be responsive to the, the desires of the voters, but we also want the system to be stable and survive, not just for a few years, but for generations to come. So in Israel, technically, you could change anything with a majority vote. You could just pass a vote with 61, call it a basic law, and change Israel's equivalent of a constitution. So that raises a very interesting question, which is how in the world is Israel still a democracy after 75 years if it's that easy to change things? And the answer is because the Supreme Court has too much power. And it does have too much power. And when Netanyahu says that the Supreme Court has too much power, he's right. They can overrule any law for any reason. They can overrule a law simply by saying it's unreasonable. If the Supreme Court of the United States wants to overrule a law, they have to show that it's unconstitutional, that it actually violates something in the Constitution. So the Supreme Court does have too much power, but the Supreme Court's excessive power in Israel is the thing that balances the Knesset's excessive power, which is their power to be able to pass basic laws with a simple majority. So right now, Netanyahu in, and the coalition are working to make changes to the courts, what they call judicial reform, and those judicial reforms will limit the power of the courts. But once that happens, that would put the Knesset in a position where they would then have the ability to make laws without adequate checks on their power. Now, back in early March, Israel's president, Isaac Herzog, made a compromise proposal which was in, included a lot of things, but one of those one of the components was that we would reduce the power of the courts to be able to change laws, but at the same time we would reduce the power of the Knesset to change basic laws, and basic laws could only be passed or modified with a supermajority vote. So you would both limit the power of the court, but also remove the need for the court to have that excessive power, and this is sort of the the talk that's been going on in these compromise talks, and it's the direction I personally believe Israel needs to go. I think that Israel has managed for a while without having the sort of structure that a mature democracy should have. Uh, and, and I think that that needs to change and that, that it will change, but also it has to change in the right way. You can't just upset the balance we have. As chaotic as the balance is, you can't just upset the balance. You have to make sure that you make changes on both sides to maintain the balance. But I'm optimistic because uh, Israel is a young democracy. When America was a young democracy, when America was just slightly older than Israel is now, it had the civil war, for goodness sake. Uh, when Israel was um, uh, a lot younger than it is now, it had the uh, the Altalena incident. Some of you might remember that, the, the sinking of the, uh, of the Etzel ship that was carrying arms. So we've come a long way from, from solve, resolving disputes by, by actually uh, opening fire on each other. And, uh, and certainly we are a long way from the kind of civil war that America experienced. Uh, but I would say this, that the protests that you see in Israel are an exercise in democracy. There's something iron ironic and saddening that people would say that these protests are a sign that Israel is no longer a democracy. In fact, they are exactly a sign of just how much a democracy Israel is. And the day that people don't protest and express their opinions is the day we should start worrying. So. That are, those are my thoughts on, um, on uh, the latest developments uh, in Israel. But if there are other developments that you're curious about, you can feel free to ask. Uh, and uh, my hope is that in the, uh, in the coming, uh, coming months and years, Reality Check will grow to be the go-to source that when this issue comes up in, uh, in the public conversation in America and in Europe, that, that they'll be coming to me and to my team to speak about this rather than to somebody who makes a uh, much poorer impression. And uh, my team so far is three people, including myself, but we're growing fast and, uh, and we hope to have more soon. And, uh, and also um, we're, you know, we're a, a 501c3 nonprofit supported entirely by charitable donations. And, and the uh, donate link is right on, on the website, on the homepage, which I'm sure has been shared with you in the chat. So if anyone does feel inspired to, uh, to want to help support our work, we really do appreciate it. But if nothing else, you absolutely, absolutely must sign up for our newsletter because we have a lot of really useful content that we put out all the time. And, uh, and of course, if you are uh, a little bit tech savvy, you should also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. 
and uh, and like and comment and share all of our posts and and help uh, help us make a, a big impact that way. And uh, with that, I'm ready to take questions. Oh, thank you. I see lots of silent uh, this, so I, I appreciate that, even though I can't hear it. Um, so how do we do questions? Does someone read them? Or just the Alana, chat or? do you want me to read them, or do you want to read them, Alana? Do you want to read them, Pam, or should I? Pam? It doesn't matter. Okay. Uh, okay. I'll read them. Okay. Fine. Okay. Um, so the first one here, I think, is from Al. What is your sense of the IHRA policy? as recently rolled out by the Biden administration. Can you comment on the effect of the nexus appendix on IHRA policy? That's yeah, if you, you know the, that's if you read the nexus appendix. <laughs> well, yeah. So what's happening is Biden's kind of trying to play all sides, but but he basically has not departed from the IRA definition. If for everyone who might not be familiar, it's the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance as a definition of anti-Semitism, because definitions are important. And it's particularly important um, it, because one of the aspects of the IRA definition is saying when you hold Israel to a double standard, that is an example of anti-Semitism. And other people say, no, I should be free to criticize Israeli policies uh, and that that can't count as anti-Semitism. And it's like, yeah, nobody's saying that counts as anti-Semitism. We're saying that double standards count as anti-Semitism. We actually had a comment on our Instagram where when I had criticized uh, um, uh, Amnesty International for uh, for changing the definition of apartheid, someone commented, well, why are you focusing on definitions and hiding behind technicalities? If Israel is engaging in brutality, then, then Amnesty is just trying to make the world a better place. And I thought, how do you respond to this correctly? Because the answer is definitions are important and it's not just a technicality. But the way I phrased this so as not to get caught up in semantics was, I'm not caring here about definitions. What I'm caring about is anti-Semitism. And if you're gonna say that apartheid means something everywhere in the world, but means something entirely different when you're talking about Jews and only about Jews, that's anti-Semitism. That should sound obvious to all of us, but that's what IRA is all about, is making sure that that kind of double standard uh, ends up being maintained. I didn't get a sense that uh, that Biden is looking to roll back or 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 uh, undo the the IRA protections or, or the endorsement of IRA that we have in the United States, uh, but um, but there is some talk about it out there, and it's important that that talk uh, not move forward and that the IRA definition. I mean, there are actually some people on the other side who say that the IRA definition doesn't do enough. Uh, I actually happen to think it's it, it does quite well. But uh, certainly we have to make sure that we don't dilute it by taking out those important provisions regarding just substituting the word Israel for Jews and, and engaging in the same anti-Semitism. So that's okay. my, my answer to that. All right. Harry has a three-part question, so I'll just do one part at a time. Um, are you able to research and criticize apartheid, not only organizations' definitions, but their methods and sources? Uh, yes, uh, we. I mean, there's actually been a lot of work already done on uh, on critiquing Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch uh, in terms of how they went about their work and and why it's problematic. The problem is a lot of that doesn't resonate uh, with young people today. It's good data to have, and I've read the various reports on it. But um, but if you go to young people and give them a 200 page report explaining why this source and this method is wrong or this is off, it it doesn't work. If you can come out with a dramatic statement that undermines their credibility in 10 seconds, then that makes a, a much bigger difference. And then of course, the next thing we do, I mentioned that we're gonna come out with our DEI study, diversity, equity, inclusion. If you have very low diversity, low equity, low inclusion, that's basically what apartheid is, especially if it's if it's in, enshrined in law. When you have high diversity, high equity, high inclusion, that's your modern Western liberal democracies. And so by doing a study like that, rather than being on the defensive, and uh, and talking about why Amnesty or Human Rights Watch is getting it wrong, we can actually be proactive and say, hey, here's a study that we've done, and this study is done properly, and this study shows something uh, something different that that everyone should know. Okay, part two: Have donations to Amnesty International gone down since your research and exposure of them? Well, our you know we've existed for about three months. 
the ability to uh, look at an organization's donations uh, is, is something you can only do after the end of the fiscal year when they file their 990 reports. So it will be a while before I have that kind of data available. Uh, my my expectation is that it will take a little bit of time in order to in order to make that happen. And also, there are some. I just like to say this, and this is true. We've actually done we've we've pulled data on this and done research on this on on a lot of controversial topics, including Israel. About ten percent of the people in the world already agree with you and always will. And that's preaching to the choir, but that's fine. About ten percent of the people will never agree with you, and there's no point in trying to argue with them except if you want if your argument is in a public forum and other people are listening but then you're not really arguing with them you're talking at them but sending a message to the audience and that leaves 80 percent of the people who might be in your audience and that's where the real work can be done these are the people who might go either way who might have opin opinions but they aren't strongly held opinions like if i asked you your opinion on the uh, conflict in the Kashmir probably you don't have an opinion and if you do it's probably not a very strongly held one and if I really talked you through it maybe I could convince you to change your mind that's how most people really are on Israel so the some of the biggest supporters of amnesty and human rights watch are going to be in that 10 percent the people you're never going to convince and and also you know you have Arab states who, who support them and they have a strong agenda however we can tap into the people they're trying to reach their their base and their the people they're trying to convince so uh so to answer your question there's a lot of things that we're working on and all of them are going to take a little bit more time than the three months we've been in existence but i do appreciate your your confidence in us okay and part three could you discuss hate crimes against people with disabilities are are they with any or specific dis or are they with any or specific disabilities uh, the FBA hate, hate crimes uh, database uh, characterizes ha has a category for uh, Americans with disabilities. It doesn't get into uh, data that's more specific than that. Uh, I, certainly, there are uh, people with different disabilities, and there are probably different levels of hate crimes against people. But it's just not in a form that uh, I was able to track with publicly available data through the FBI database. But we do see that there is a decrease in hate crimes against Americans with disabilities based on uh, based on the, the it correlated to the states that have Holocaust education. And by the way, if you're wondering why that's the case, we have a working hypothesis, which we are exploring with our current field study. So I should have definitive data on this soon. But the working hypothesis is that the Holocaust teaches, uh, as opposed to most kinds of history, it, it has a very strong focus on individuals. Most history you hear about generals and presidents and kings and borders and battles. In the Holocaust, you hear about Oscar Schindler and Anne Frank and the individual. And on the other side of the, the coin, you have the, the, the local German or Pole who is turning their neighbors into the Gestapo. But you walk away from that with a very real sense that individuals make a difference. And if you happen to be an individual, which all of us are, then you start realizing, hey, I make a difference too, even though I'm not a, a general or a president. And I think when people, my, our, I think, I'll say it more technically, our working hypothesis is that when people start to see that, it causes them to take greater care with their own behavior. Because I, I really do believe that a lot of the hate that we see these days stems from people feeling that they are powerless in the world and they, they want to go out and do something dramatic to change that. And people don't realize that every little thing you do every day is more powerful than you know, which means that not only are you powerful and you don't need to do something dramatic, but you have to take great care with the power that you already have. Okay, and Harry has another one. Is a goal to have satellite reality check groups in different countries? And have you had negative feedback or threats from, uh, from extreme right and left wing groups? If so, what steps do you take for security? Well, our goal is to do work in every place that, that it's needed. And my philosophy as a manager is I don't open offices and get staff just for the sake of having it. I would never say my goal is to have 100 employees or to be in 50 locations. My goal is to do work that has impact all over the world. Now, as we do that work, if we discover that some of that work requires opening a branch office, then certainly we'll do that, assuming we have the need and that we have the resources, which is, of course, where you guys and, and all of your friends come in to make sure we get those resources. But um, 
but what drives us is the work and the goal. And so it will just be a matter of time to see if our work starts requiring us to have greater physical presence in different places. In that case, we will. So far, I have not been faced with a security threat, but uh, if I ever am, we'll take appropriate steps. I do expect it may happen uh, from time to time on campuses. Uh, and if it does, we'll, uh, we'll make the effort to, uh, to make sure that we have appropriate security people with us in the appropriate amount. And we'll talk to the experts and figure out from them what specifically is needed for different situations. Um, although I heard a funny story, Jordan Peterson once said, the way he stopped getting shouted down on campus was now he schedules his campus talks for eight o'clock in the morning because he says that all of these social justice warriors, they care about these issues deeply and passionately, but not quite passionately enough to get up at eight in the morning. So uh, that that's apropos of nothing. I just happen to remember it at this moment. Right. Carol and Barry ask, how do you do how do you deal with the question of the occupation with students? Uh, that's a very good, uh, a very good question. Um, now, obviously, this always depends on where you are. You got to meet people where you are. Who are you talking to? What's the context of the conversation? And I'll give you sort of a uh, sort of a, um, a right leaning answer that I gave once and a left leaning answer that I gave once. And the right leaning answer was I was at a dinner. This was an easy one. I was at a dinner with a group of uh, veterans of Iraq and Afghanistan in America, and uh, and they said to me, "Well, you know uh, what." Uh, you know, why, why doesn't Israel just give up those occupied territories? I mean, what, what, what's what's the point in holding on to them? You just give it up. It's just a little bit of land and then you'll have peace. And I said to them, well, you know, the, the specific territories that you're referring to happen to be located in a highly strategic location. And uh, and if Israel were to not have a, a presence there, then it could be. And I didn't even get to finish the sentence. That was it. I mean, they're soldiers to them. The words highly strategic location are synonymous with life and death. They get it. Enough said. So that's something you can say there. But if you're talking to someone whose priority is, is human rights, they might say, well, I don't care about your security. I care about how you're treating other human beings. And that's what's important. And uh, what I sometimes say to people, we're not pressed for time, are we? I have a few minutes I can share this answer because there's there's a little nuance to it and uh, it, to the way I express it. And But if, if you have the right audience and the right moment and people are listening, it, it's just a beautiful story. The um, you may have heard of uh, Sheikh Jarrah, which is a, uh, a neighborhood in Jerusalem that uh, once upon a time used to be uh, home to, to Jews. And uh, then Jordan conquered that area in 1948, 1949, and uh, either killed or exiled all the Jews and gave those homes to Palestinians. Then in 1967, Israel came back in control of that area. And now we've had a problem ever since then because there are Palestinians living in those homes. They've been living there for a couple of generations now. Some of the people living there did not take the home from anyone, may not have even been born at the time that the home was taken from its original Jewish owners. And yet um, and, and yet the home was taken from, from Jewish owners. And so Jewish owners are going and saying, well, you know, this is our home and, and we should have it back. And you stole it in an act of war. So what do you do there? I mean, can you imagine if I were to go to the home my grandparents grew up in in Poland and say, I want this home back. Well, there are people living there now. And those people, I mean, they may have ultimately gotten it from someone who stole it, but the people living there now probably didn't. They probably weren't even alive then. And I don't know that I would feel comfortable trying to do this. So what do you do? There's no good answer there. And the truth, and, and this is what you don't hear about, the truth is that the Israelis uh, who, who had lost those homes, or the Jews, because this was, you know, they were living there before the state of Israel was formed, the Jews who lost their homes and the Palestinians who were living there now uh, had a series of talks and came and, and the Palestinians didn't feel good about it either. They didn't want to leave their home, but at the same time, they, they didn't feel good about the fact that their home had been taken from, from somebody else in a, a really violent way. So they, uh, they had a series of talks and eventually they came to a compromise. And the compromise essentially was that the Palestinians would continue living there but the ownership would be transferred over to the Jewish owners and the Palestinian families would pay a nominal fee of a couple of dollars a year or something like that, just as a way of showing that they acknowledge that this home really does belong to someone else. And that, that was the compromise that was on the table. 
uh, it wasn't clear to me what would happen if someone wanted to sell the home and, and make some profit on it. But but that was the compromise on the table, an imperfect solution for an imperfect situation, but it takes everybody's needs and emotions into account. Shortly before they were going to go to court and finalize this agreement, the uh, a number of Palestinian terror groups, including forces of the Palestinian Authority government, visited these Palestinian families and uh, threatened them with life and limb and torture and all sorts of horrible things if they would dare to be traitors and collaborators and agree to this peaceful solution. And so now this remains a, uh, a an unsolved problem and a source of tension. And by the way, this conflict, this is what this is what uh, initiated the Gaza war uh, a couple of years ago that it initiated with with this conflict that ended up getting blown up and then started uh, resulting in rocket launches. This is a microcosm of the entire uh, it, Palestinian territories in the West Bank, which is its places that used to be Jewish homes in some cases that have a great deal of ancient Jewish history in many cases, but now have people living there who have been living there for some time and also feel a strong connection. And many of those people, the Jews and the Palestinians, really do want to work out a resolution where everybody can live there and 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 proclaim the connection that they feel. And yet you have these terror organizations that are preventing it. And it's not even handed. It's not like, well, Israel does it too and Palestinians do it. In, in Palestinian society, you don't have freedom of speech. You have arbitrary arrests. You have torture. You have a climate of fear. And so we don't even know how many Palestinians might be wanting and trying to to build bridges with Israelis, because if they do, they could suffer death or worse. And uh, that's the reality of the situation we have right now. And that's the reality of of the occupied territories. It's not about territory. It's about these uh, these phenomena that, that we're struggling with. OK, Cheryl says this is awesome. Thanks so much for the work you do. Is there any role or any suggestions for those of us who look for ways to support these efforts, but do not have the resources or specific skill sets that you and your organization? Uh, well, thank you. Um, thank you for saying that it's awesome, Cheryl. I really appreciate that. Um, yeah, so uh, obviously there's uh, financial support makes a big difference, but in addition to that, you know, uh, getting on our newsletter makes a huge difference. Inviting other people to get on our newsletter makes a big difference. We're relatively new and we need to grow as much as we can. And if you are at all social media savvy, following us and sharing on social media, you know, everything on social media works on algorithms, which means that uh, that the more people like and comment and share and engage with our content, the more these platforms will share it with wider audiences. If I put up a post, and everybody here immediately starts engaging with that post, then Instagram or Facebook's algorithm says, oh, this post is popular, I should show it to more people. And that's how we get out beyond the choir is by having a strong group of people in the choir, uh, what in social media experts call advocates, to jump in right away every time we have a post and make sure to engage with it and share it far and wide. And then of course our newsletter as well. It's great content for you, but also it allows us to let you know when something's coming up or when we might need you to jump in and share something or tell people about something or whatever it is. So um, those are all things that you can do that are really helpful for growth. I just wanna interject because I know some people are gonna have questions. I've already liked you on Facebook and gotten on your newsletter, but um, if you have trouble finding, I was having a little trouble finding the Facebook page. If you go to his website and go all the way to the bottom, there'll be a direct link to Facebook and then you can like it. I just don't yeah, want to get lost. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, Ilana. It's, it's a very good, important point that uh, until we start getting really big, the algorithm doesn't uh, favor us in the searches either. Right, right. So, but you can mm -hmm. find us simply by going to uh, our uh, website. Yeah. And uh, yeah, down at the bottom, the website has links to everything. And um, one thing about the newsletter that if you sign up on the website, one of the things that that uh, is available or that comes out is a a quick uh, what one minute little blurb periodically or two minutes. So it doesn't take a long time to read something, but it's it's something new, some new information that's you know a minute or two. And it's it's very interesting. Um, okay, Al 
is or isn't hate speech considered free speech? On what basis can prosecution in the U.S. proceed? Yeah, uh, hate speech is 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 uh, protected by. I mean, speech is protected by the First Amendment, even if it's categorized as hate speech. You remember the Nazis marched in Skokie, and uh, and but uh, specifically, what I was. Why did my what just happened here? I lost my video. Um, there we go. Now I'm back. Um, what I was, uh, I, I don't know if you were referring to what I was speaking about in our, our survey, our, our research study. Our research study, we were talking about hate crimes, which is different than hate speech. Hate crimes can be anything from uh, graffiti uh, or uh, shouting insults, which graffiti is illegal, shouting insults is not, all the way up to uh, physical violent attacks or murders, which are also considered hate crimes. And uh, we want to reduce hate crimes through education. Just because something's legal doesn't mean you should do it. And so if education can help reduce hate crimes, even the hate crimes that are legal, then education is a way to do it. Uh, but then if, if when we talk about criminal prosecutions, we, uh, we reduce, you know, we address those related to, to those hate crimes that are actually uh, illegal, such as, um, such as uh, violence uh, or, or graffiti or vandalism or things like that. But, um, but again, I'm not, I'm not working in law enforcement. I'm working in another area in which I believe we have a really good shot at reducing hate crimes and hate speech, even the hate crimes and hate speech that don't violate specific laws. Okay, Julian, excellent presentation. I commend you for your work and approach. Certainly, I will review your website to, oh, to learn more, uh, more plans to sign up, to learn more, plan to sign up for the newsletter. Thank you. Okay, great question. Marty, what, what do you recommend as good sources to get current information about Jews and Israel, like weekly or monthly? Well, first of all, you can sign up for our newsletter, and we try to address some of the latest topics that come up. We're not actually a news source where we're sort of telling you every day what happened today. Uh, there are a number of publications out there. You can read the Israeli ones. You can read a, a variety of them. All the Israeli ones have their leaning right or left, you know, but there's the Jerusalem Post. There's the Times of Israel. There's Yidiot Ynet. There's, uh, um, there's others. Uh, but one thing that I've learned over time is that, you know, people always ask me, what, what source can I read that I can always trust? And the answer is, you can't. We live in a world, maybe we always did, but certainly now we live in a world where you've got to use that critical thinking. Ask yourself, what I'm reading here, does it make logical sense? Does it add up? How does it compare to other sources I've looked at? And that's actually good uh, advice, not just with respect to Israel, but with respect to to uh, anything, uh, any topic that, that you're interested in. And so uh, a good example is you could see something uh, a source say something about Israel in the headline, and then, you know, later on toward the end of the article, it says something that contradicts the headline. Well, right off the bat, you know that that's a little bit of a red flag, that uh, that the, own, the article itself is not consistent. Or sometimes you'll read something that just doesn't make logical sense, and uh, if you just think about it. And so these are these are the red flags that the the clues that it's time to look more and do a little digging, find the sources that do make sense on that topic. And even some a source that's very good usually could sometimes publish something that isn't so good. So uh, so the the bottom line is, you know, keep using that critical thinking, keep the mind sharp. And get our newsletter. Yeah. Hey, okay. um, I got a question. Wait, wait, Barry, let me finish yeah, through the yeah, ones. Yeah, that yeah, yeah. Keep it in your yeah. mind. Got um it. Okay, will you be working with the Jewish students on other U.S. college campuses during the coming school year? Yes, we absolutely will. We are putting together a uh, campus tour now, and uh, we hope to visit as many campuses as we possibly can. Our goal is not just to speak with Jewish students, which is important because they need our help, but also to get invited to some mainstream events. For example, we're doing research so anyone uh, who deals in research or if there's a group on campus that deals in uh, history or political science or any place we can get invited to to get this message out beyond the choir but then also to speak to those jewish students who need uh, our help and our tools so the answer is absolutely yes and more details will come out as uh, as we begin to create them 
Okay, Lois says, excellent presentation. Thank you. Um, Jeffrey asked if there's a uh, uh, channel on YouTube and then Harry put down, um, is this the correct one, yes. Daniel? That, that is the correct one. Right now, our, okay. our most of our uh, focus has been on uh, Instagram and Twitter and Facebook, but um, and, and to the greatest extent, Instagram actually, because it's a real powerful way to reach young people. But when we have something uh, that is visual, such as uh, an interview on television or, or whatnot, we will put that on our, our YouTube channel as well. Uh, eventually, we will probably reach a point where we start creating content specifically for YouTube that we put up all the time. But um, but right now, uh, it's just sort of uh, when we have the occasional television appearance. However, if any of you are familiar with Instagram, there's a thing on Instagram called Reels. You can actually see our Reels on Facebook, too. And uh, every once in a while, I'll speak about some topic in a very informal way. It's not in a studio. I'm not dressed up, but I'll just get in front of the camera and uh, give a 60-second a, a uh, talk about some topic that's hot at that moment. And, uh, and you can find that in our reels as well. And this, and this program is being recorded. So this will be on YouTube for people to look at or to spread around. Jeff says, thank you, Daniel. Great work. Um, Alvin asked again, there are approximately 200 territorial disputes around the world, including involving Israel. Why is occupied territories not termed disputed territories? Um, and then there are approximately 200 territorial disputes around the world. Why aren't the territories that Israel secured in a defense of war in 1967 um, considered in dispute and not occupied? Well, that's a, it's a good question. That The reason is basically because there are people in the world who want to call them uh, occupied, and so they go ahead and do that. When I have to call them something, I, I usually refer to them as disputed, or I might just refer to them by their specific names, the West Bank, Judea, Samaria, Gaza, or I might call them the Palestinian territories if, if they happen to be territories, you know, they're, they're beyond the green line, there are areas where Jews live and where Palestinians live. So I'll use whatever term I feel is most appropriate. I don't use the term occupied. Uh, but it is interesting to note that the Israeli Supreme Court does treat the disputed territories as uh, occupied and requires that Israel follow the, the rules of the Geneva Convention with respect to occupation. Um, now, that's, that's in, that, that is worth knowing only because if somebody uh, accuses Israel of violating international law or not following the Geneva Conventions, the fact is that Israel does follow the Geneva Conventions, follows them very closely, and uh, the Supreme Court is constantly policing Israel's following of those Geneva Conventions. So even if we don't consider the territories to be occupied, we nonetheless follow all the international laws that would be relevant if they were occupied. And that, uh, that's something that, um, that, that uh, a burden that our Supreme Court has put upon us and that we put upon ourselves. But it, there's also a complexity there in that um, in order for the territories to be truly um, is, as long as the territories have the designation of occupation, Israel does not have an obligation to give citizenship to all of the Palestinians who live in those territories. Those Palestinians, of course, are citizens of the Palestinian Authority government. Um, if Israel were to, say, annex those territories and make them part of Israel, Israel would then be required to give citizenship to all those Palestinians. And given that Israel is a democracy, uh, within one election, Israel would become a Muslim state. So. Uh, so it, it starts getting very, uh, very tricky there. Uh, but, you know, and this is maybe not a useful direction to take when you're advocating, but occupation, strictly speaking, is not necessarily a bad thing. America occupied Japan and occupied Germany and made some very positive changes in those places before, before eventually rebuilding democracy there and, and leaving. Uh, however, uh, the term has come to have such a um, negative meaning today that uh, that it, it becomes important to point out that this is a dispute and and not an occupation. Okay, Victor asked, didn't Ariel Sharon call them occupied territories? I'm not sure about that. Like I said, I know that the Supreme Court uh, did call them that. And of course, you know, the, a, a common... Uh, 
refrain among uh, many Jews and many Israelis is you can't occupy your own land. This has been a part of the kingdom of David and the kingdom of Israel for, for thousands of years. And in, in that sense, it's not uh, occupied. And there is some truth to that. However, if we were to really go all the way with that, we would annex them. And then we would have to deal with having to give citizenship to a number of people that would uh, eventually outnumber the number of Jews in Israel. So as long as we choose to not annex, we end up leaving these territories in this strange in-between status where we just have to, to deal with a number of conflicting realities. All right, Barry, do you remember what your question was? Barry, you're muted. I'm muted now. Okay, number one, I wanna sign up for your, uh, okay. your program, which is terrific. You're doing a fabulous job. Um, you, the problem is I don't, I don't, I tried to sign up for some of this stuff and I'm not on Facebook. I don't want to sign up. I don't want to be on LinkedIn. Uh, the other one, Instagram, I, I don't get on that stuff. I'd be on it 24 seven. So I you would like you I don't have to be Gary. OK, well, tell me how I can. Uh, I have I, a, a, a site here. Uh, reality I check put it in research. the chat, Barry. Reality I don't chat, sweetheart. Harry, I'm, go to the website and no, sign no, up. I the didn't, newsletter. Yeah, reality Harry, pardon? check. I didn't say chat. Reality check research. Got it. Org. Org slash do donation. Got that one. Well, donation is for the donations, but without the donation, then you're just into the website. Great. So Harry, okay. sign up for the newsletter, and then you'll get an email. You don't have to go on social media. Okay, so I, to sign up. So I'll sign up with that. Now, if I want to donate, the question I have, um, by donating online, we're running into problems here. Every time you donate stuff, our, our accounts have been hacked here. Uh, so I'm, I hate to put in my credit information. I'd like to donate. Is there some way we can mail a check or, or get funds to you? That's my question. Uh, yeah, there certainly is. And our address for mailing a check is, uh, is up there on the website as well. But I'll tell you that uh, when you donate to us, when you put in your credit card information, it doesn't go to us. It goes to Stripe. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Stripe. It's similar to PayPal, um, but it's a third party credit card processing company. Right. So just like you pay for anything in a store with your credit card, it always gets processed through a third party. So when you put your details in our website, it doesn't go through us. It goes through the third party. And, and part of their job is to have all that security in place. And that's what they do. But uh, we do have a, but we do have a mailing address as well, if that if that's something you prefer. Thank you. Yeah. And Barry, if you have questions about signing up, just you know, ask me later. Write to me later, Alana. We'll do. Thank and you. And walk you through it later. We'll walk you. We are a five one c three. We give tax receipts for everything. So uh, great. That's great. out there. And if if you're in some country other than the United States and you want a tax receipt somewhere else, just get in touch with us. Uh, by email and talk to us, and we can arrange for uh, a, a few other countries as well. Daniel, All right, and um, Barry, Harry put Harry put the the or for other people too. Harry put the address there for donating by check. Ah, uh, yes, it's in the chat right there. But it's on the website also. Daniel, this is the terrific. And Steve says great pre presentation. Uh, I just wonder if you would consider uh, revisiting with us at uh, some point in time. Uh, to kind of reinforce some of the elements that you've progressed. I, ha I have two observations. Uh, speaking to a, an American audience, uh, the comparison between the Israeli Supreme Court and the American Supreme Court is not really a fair comparison. In our minds, we think they're similar. They're vastly different. Uh, and also the comparison between the basic laws and the American Constitution also is a very unfair comparison because they're just totally different. Uh, for example, going to the Supreme Court, the American Supreme Court does something like uh, something like 50 or 60 uh, decisions a year. The Israeli Supreme Court does 15,000 a year. So it's, it's a wholly different function. Uh, the uh, basic laws are uh, legislative uh, pieces of work that seem to happen at the rate of something like three a generation or five a generation. In other words, it's a very stretched out uh, assemble, uh, assemblage of legislation over the period of 50 or 60 years. It's not a single document anywhere that can be pointed to. So I just think that 
that speaking to our audience um, will draw the wrong conclusions based on our, you know, desire for comparison or comparative analysis. Just thought I'd throw that out. Yeah, well, thank you for that. And also thank you for inviting me to come back again. I'd love to, it's so nice to speak to you guys. Uh, and yeah, apropos of uh, comparisons with uh, the Supreme Court and, and with the legislative bodies, I mean, that really is precisely my point. They are very different. But the question that Israeli society is asking itself, that Netanyahu is 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 uh, forcing us to ask ourselves, and that that we are talking and protesting about, is not what our system is, but what our system ought to be. be yeah. And uh, and when considering that, I think it makes sense to look at not just the United States, but all of the countries that we. Uh, that we appreciate and admire and would like to compare ourselves to and and ask ourselves which elements of different countries we think would be uh, suitable for for us. And the answer to that is not yet clear, but that's what Israel is struggling with today. Mm -hmm. no, thank you. Anybody else have any questions? I do have one additional. There are a couple of organizations that I'm familiar with have missions which are sort of tangential to what you're proposing, Daniel. Uh, one of them is um, ProPublica. Another one is an organization called Braver Angels. Another one is the Focus Project. Um, they seem to have elements of what you've presented to us today. Uh, I'm just wondering, there might be some value in uh, correlating with some of those, and I'd be glad to make the connection. Well, thanks for suggesting that. I, I'd love to look into that. It's a very nice idea. Daniel, this is Barry. Um, Hi. Great, great presentation. It's good to see you again. Um, Likewise. The question about the uh, about the, the possible change in the uh, in the in the structure of of the of the Supreme Court. Uh, if you want a two thirds supermajority in the Knesset to change a law, if you look at the history of Israel, nothing's ever going to get changed. So I mean it. While it's hard in the United States to make a cha constitutional change, how how long how long has it been since the two thirds majority in the Knesset of one party, ever? Yeah, well, maybe part of the reason why we don't have a constitution is because we can't get enough people to agree on it. But a supermajority uh, can be done in different ways. It doesn't necessarily have to be two thirds. Uh, a supermajority just means anything beyond a simple majority. There are other ways of structuring it too. For example, in the United States. Uh, it's it's not just two thirds of the Congress. It's actually seventy five percent, which is even more than two thirds, but not of the Congress of the fifty states. So you have to get seventy five percent of the fifty state legislatures to agree. The bottom line is that there are many different ways that you could structure a supermajority system to allow a certain amount of flexibility while at the same time uh, preventing uh, the, the idea is to make sure that any of these basic law decisions are the kinds of decisions that we can all get behind, such as people should have individual rights and not decisions that have a specific political agenda, such as um, you know, only people from my party should be allowed to vote or that sort of thing. Okay, and Rochelle had, is it Rochelle that I saw who had her hand up? I, I just yeah. wanted to add to, uh, to Steve's list, the Sharat Hadin, I'm wondering whether they also, uh, whether you could use this organization's findings to help you. Uh, it's possible on if, on issues that are uh, of relevance. I mean, they tend to be very legally uh, oriented. And I, if I'm not mistaken, a lot of their work involves actually bringing uh, specific lawsuits. Uh, but from time to time, you know, we look at the findings of many other organizations, both in the Jewish slash Israeli world and also in the, in the mainstream general world to uh, help supplement uh, our data and allow us to draw conclusions. I mean, just for example, the FBI provided us with a lot of data that, that helped with our last study. Uh, so yeah, we're, we're always looking for anyone that has complementary data that we can synthesize in, in a way that, uh, that, that hasn't been done before and that has a meaningful effect. Great. Do you have to pay for the data from the FBI? No, it's on their website. And in fact, anyone can access it. So if you guys ever are interested in geeking out a little bit, or if there's any statisticians in the room here, you can just uh, Google FBI hate crimes database, and you can jump in there and, and start uh, uh, looking for yourself. That's actually how this originally came about, was I just went on the 
on the database and started looking for patterns and started noticing, hey, there's something going on here. Now, since then, it's it's become a lot more sophisticated. We're working with several professional academics, a professional market research firm, and of course, UNESCO. But it just began with uh, with me just looking at the, the data. By the way, if, if, on other topics, there's um, uh, a, a great site called Our World in, in Data or Our World in Numbers. I, I forget the exact name uh, right now, but uh, but that has a lot. And uh, there's another uh, website called Statista, which has a lot of great data that we've also used for this. And you can you do do use it for for any number of different topics, not just ones related to Jews and and, and Israel. You know, if you want to know uh, whether the icebergs, or the glaciers are melting or whether uh, there's deforestation or what the carbon levels are, I mean, all these sorts of things you can you can find there. If you want to know the, the levels of poverty in former Soviet republics since the fall of the Soviet Union, you can figure that out right there. All, all these you can you can just really explore amazing things in your world. Harry, the FBI website thing is you'll find the information right next to your picture, you know. <laughs> on the at the post uh, office most wanted uh yes all right Stephen Katz said uh no that's not it Stephen it's not um dot com it's dot org it is dot org although thanks for pointing that out because I do think we should get we own the dot com domain name and we should set it up with a forwarding thing so it takes you over there but uh yes it is dot org okay Stephen are you there did you hear that I hope. Oh, you're still there. So I hope you heard that, Stephen. Steve? Okay. Um, Cheryl asks, time permitting, just wondering if you are aware of any legal effort to decertify, not sure what the term would be, of particularly antagonistic organizations such as SJP on college campuses. Yeah, you know, the the First Amendment is very strong. I mean, remember, America is the country where the Nazis marched in Skokie. And if, if that if something that extreme can't be stopped, then uh, then these things uh, couldn't be stopped either to to really um, eliminate a, a company's um, or an organization's nonprofit status or to get them restricted from functioning in the US, you would uh, essentially have to either show that they were engaged in financial fraud and misuse of donor money and things like that or you would have to show that they were actually uh, directly connected with terror organizations. And I know there's some uh, efforts going on with CARE, which is the, um, the, uh, the, uh, an American uh, Muslim organization that does have connections to terror organizations, but so far no one's been able to show the connections are direct and strong enough that it could actually overcome the barriers needed to, uh, to actually um, remove their nonprofit status or prevent them from, from functioning. So yes, it can be done, but it's very difficult because America's philosophy is we'd rather screw up and have some people talking who shouldn't than to screw up in the other way and shut down free speech uh, more, than, more than we should. And someone else wrote, thank you. And uh, I think everybody thanks you for your talking and for staying on for all this time because as you all know it's already 10 30 here in israel so, yes, you know. it is. so, so thank, thank you guys so much for anyone thank else you so much else? daniel really no, this was incredible. This was yeah. incredible. that's great thanks for staying up so late and we look forward to uh crossing paths again i i just uh, just want you to know that you're following a um a um a path that generals and um and uh, even the head of the uh, Shiradin, uh, what, what was her name, um, uh, spoke with us in the past. And so you're following on a distinguished group of people, including some of Israel's uh, most important archaeologists and yeah, others. Well, so thank you. Well, thank you. I'm so glad to be in such distinguished company. Yeah. And thank you guys yeah. really very yeah. much for having me and for taking the time out of your day to be here with me. Right. Now, this entire presentation will be up on YouTube under the Volunteers for Israel channel of which there is uh, something like 80 or 100 YouTubes, uh, many of them from our past presentations on the on this uh, Educates program. So thank you very much again. At this point in time, we're going to turn over to our normal schmooze session, which lasts till infinity or until everybody gets worn out. <laughs> You're all welcome to join with us. Just hang on. We're in schmooze, and I will stop uh, recording. Stop, yeah, stop recording.
Daniel.